Okay. Um, right, good evening, everybody. What we're going to try and do is a little bit of a double act to look at various aspects of uh, the site at Swandro, which is on the island of Ralse. And um, the thing that attracted us to the site was that it was uh, eroding into the sea. And we were really interested in aspects of the Iron Age because we spent the last, um, uh, I suppose, last uh, 25 years looking at uh, Iron Age settlement. And um, uh, we were also interested in aspects of uh, how these settlements, these big Iron Age villages, uh, continue through into the later Iron Age and then into the Pictish period and become focal points for uh, Viking settlements. And we've got uh, in the new Vikings uh, in Scotland volume that, that's uh, going to come out uh, probably end of this year or early next year, uh, there's going to be a chapter looking at the, those aspects. Okay, so I'm going to pass over to Julie who's going to talk a little bit about the background. Okay, so um, as Roland already said to you that we're working on um, uh, the island of Rousey, which is um, just off the uh, northern part of mainland Orkney. Um, what do you think? We want the pen. That's not the, yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> um, it's just off the northern part of mainland Orkney, and um, they it's um, on the southern part of that um, coastline. It's not doing it. Okay. Um, so you can see the site of Swandro there, and it's right next to, as Steve was just mentioning, one of the things that had, we've been feeling um, developing as an idea for many years now is that the sites that the Vikings are starting to settle in, in places like Orkney and Shetland, are very much not new sites, but, but old sites that are high in status um, and quite often have the best land attached to them. And that seems to be what they're going for. And um, Swandro is a really interesting case in point because right next to it is the uh, uh, a cemetery at Westness, which is um, um, a big Viking cemetery that I, I'm going to show you in a minute. And it's um, in itself a really important site, but unfortunately one that hasn't been populated in the 1970s. Um, so I can only tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the other reason we were really interested in this particular site is we've been working on some little sites along the coast of Rousey, because Rousey is one of the very many coasts in Scotland which is affected by coastal erosion. And some of the other sites we were looking at were cliff erosion sites, the kind of thing you normally see. And what's unusual about Rouse, about Swandro is that it's, a, it's actually a boulder beach. And most of the archeology span we're going to show you is actually, was actually buried beneath the boulder beach. And um, you'd think, well, I always thought nothing would survive under those conditions, but you'd think that maybe with that material on top, um, things would be, would if it's there would survive better, but it's not true. As you can see from this photograph, which is um, uh, taken by um, Catherine Marwick, who is um, uh, the farmer, one of the farmers of, of the area. Um, and she goes out and takes photographs for us in the winter so we can see what's happening to our poor backfill site. And as you can see, those waves quite often just cover the entire site. Um, and the logo next to it, which um, um, we would be in trouble if we didn't show is for the, for the um, charitable trust which we're involved with, which is looking particularly at Swandro, but also other coastal archaeology sites in Orkney. Um, so I said about the Westness graves, and this is just a, a little taster of them from the, from the few slides that are available. And you can see that the kind of thing we're talking about. Um, there are two boat burials at, at Westness. Um, new, new isotopic work on both of those burials shows that they are men who were um, well, who died violently, but were also born somewhere north of the Arctic Circle. So probably somewhere like Northern Norway. And this beautiful brooch, it's a, it's a, um, a, a penannular brooch um, in the Irish style really, but with a runic inscription on the back of it. So a bit of the loot probably that they brought with them. 
Don't say something like that. Right. Uh, th this is the Bay of Swandro, just along from uh, uh, West Ness. And what's interesting about um, that is, and I'm not sure. Can you can you see can you see the pointer? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, th this is the actual now of Swandro, and um, th so th this is uh, taken from drone footage and created into a, a three dimensional model. And uh, what we have is a is a mound, a slight mound around the this side of coming off this side of the, the larger mound, the, the, the now Swandro. And what we have here are the remains of two Norse houses. So the interesting thing is these these are quite late, the houses. And these were also dug in the 1970s. They're also not published yet. Um, but there are some photographs in archive. You can find them on Canmore. And um, you can see maybe from these photographs um, right there at the back, that is the now of Swandro there. And these are the Norse houses that Steve's just been talking about in front of them. Now, although they're not published, we looking at the material that's there, we thought these were probably quite late. So these weren't the houses of those people in the Westerners Cemetery. But on the other hand, it did suggest that there were um, earlier settlers somewhere very close by that were buried in that cemetery. And the other thing I should say about the Westerners Cemetery is underneath the Viking graves, there are Pictish graves. And uh, as we'll see, we've probably almost certainly found where the people buried there in the Pictish period lived. The other thing about Swandro is as well as those burials um, actually on that promontory, in the 19th century, this sword and uh, quite probably also a shield boss were ploughed up somewhere around the Mount now Swandro, which suggests that there's another Viking, early Viking grave actually somewhere around that mound as well, or there was, I doubt it very much, it's there now. Here you can see um, the, those buildings again, those Norse halls that we, as, as Sigrid Callens, who actually excavated them, called them. Um, and you can see here's the curve of the bay coming around the eroding bay. These are our trenches here, and you can see that one of these houses actually overlays just the, the edge of the bay there. The rest of it has gone. Um, but again, we'll be coming back to that building that it overlays in a little while. It's really difficult to see as a, as a mound from the road above or even from um, quite close by. It's a really awkward place because it's right on the side of a hill. That This maybe gives you some indication. Um, I think we took this from standing a meter or two lower than this as well. And you can see that's a, um, a two meter pole there. So the mound itself is several meters high. So that at its highest point, there's already several meters of archeology. span And as you'll see, there's more below it as well. And again, just to give you some idea of the curve of this bay with the Boulder Beach and um, some of our um, excavations, we've been working there for several years now, but every year we have to um, cover it all up with the boulders again in the hope of um, preserving as much as we can. And then the next year, we, we have to take all the boulders off again. So anyone who knows the site very well tries not to come either at the beginning or the end, because that's where all the hard work is. And what we're finding under that boulder beach is actually quite stunning. You can see here um, the, uh, um, these concentric rings of, of stone, which we, we've had quite a lot of trouble working out what on earth is going on here. Because if you look, um, our original thought was a, a brock, but actually if you look, this is an outer face here, another outer face here, another outer face here. And they're stepped as well, which might just be to do with the erosion. But it was quite difficult to understand at first what was going on. The other thing we've been doing over the years we've been working on this is um, as laser scanning was developing, as digital recording of sites was developing, um, we were actually doing quite a lot of that material for, for quite a few years now. And the point of that almost was because this is not a site we're going to be able to preserve for anyone to look at in years to come. It will have gone, it's already going. And um, so the only way we can preserve it really is digitally. And the whole idea of this is that in, in years to come, people will be able to 
you know, just as you go back to a site that was dug 50 years ago and walk around what's left of it and try to understand the walls, you won't be able to do that with Swandro. Uh, but what we can do at least is have a digital model that people can look at and understand and, and get some information from. And I should have said that the young lady standing there with the tripod um, is now just starting a, a, a PhD with us at, at Bradford, with Steve and me and other people on the digital side at Bradford and with um, Historic Environment Scotland. Um, and she's bringing up really up-to-date techniques to un try and understand that coastal erosion, try and help us look at other sites like Swandra as well to see what we can do about them and what we can find out. The archaeology, if you, if you think of a layer cake that someone, some mad person has taken a, a knife to at 45 degrees, and think about that, so the bit at the bottom that exposed obviously is going to be the earliest, but almost there is more early material exposed than later, because as we come up the beach um, and, and come up through time, if you like, come closer and closer to the present day, there is less and less material left on the beach exposure and we're trying not to go too back in too far back into the material that's still um, covered obviously um, so really most of what we're doing is on that beach exposure uh, but nevertheless as you can see from where those people are working here um, some of this archaeology this is all under the beach under those boulders and you can see we have also stats we have standing archaeology walls and so on which is really still quite high and quite well preserved So this is basically where we are at the moment. This, this, this paler green marks the edge of the beach here. Um, and we have actually been allowed by Historic Scotland to, to excavate a little bit further inland so that we can try to understand better these structures on the beach. But here you see these big curving walls on the beach here and um, a series of bu buildings along that coastline. And I don't know, on the size of your screens if you can make out those numbers but Steve's going to take you through some of these buildings and what they are and what age they are yeah okay the the first building that we found was uh, a building that uh, had a series of upright stones or uh, orthostats uh, that formed an arc and uh, that um, arc of stones, just the very tops of, the, of those upright stones were, were, was actually protruding from the, uh, storm, uh, the storm beach. So that was the, the big identifier, if you like, of how we managed to see that archaeology was surviving underneath the, the storm beach. And with clearing that away, uh, we, we've been able to get some understanding of uh, the uh, the archaeological sequence. And as Julie says, um, the, the, as you're nearer on the, to, towards the sea, um, you, you're earlier in time. So basically what, what we're seeing is a series of erosion terraces uh, of, of different time. And this uh, structure is a very uh, good example that actually shows that. Now the building itself, the bit that we've got left is just this little arc coming around here and it's been truncated along the line here uh, by the sea. And uh, if, you, if you look at that flag there, what's really interesting, the, these are the upright stones, and this is one massive flag, that's a metre pole. And you can see the two um, slots that have been cut out of that massive flag, which are post settings. So what we can actually imagine is that probably this is a multi-storey building with a, a mezzanine floor around the circumference of that building. So an open center with a, a mezzanine floor. Now we, we've got parallels to that from the sites that we've excavated in Shetland. Um, but it's just a, a small insight into the structural complexity that we're seeing in the Iron Age. Go to the next one. Um, this is the, um, the uh, site. And what I want to draw your attention to is uh, the archaeology here uh, go, um, uh, in this area here. These are the, the, the big upright uh, flags. Um, that big flag is there. Uh, there's a passageway coming through, several doorways coming into this building. 
Now this is the pit bit that's been truncated. So the sea has taken the rest of that building away. And what we're seeing underneath it are earlier deposits. And we'll come on to talking about that a little bit later. But if we look at the, um, this side of the building, and the, here we've got a, the, this arc of, of uprights that form the circumference of the building, uh, built into um, the circumference, we've got this stone feature here which is an oven, and next to it, we've got this massive series of haars, and you can see one of the lower haars there, um, which overlies the, the earlier archeology. span If we go to the next one. Now we've got uh, dates for archeomagnetic uh, dating, and we've also got radiocarbon dates, which gives us an idea of, uh, of time, that that building was in use somewhere it, within the first century BC, first century AD uh, time period. Uh, so, uh, looking at that, 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 that structure, we've got an almost identical parallel at the Brock village that we excavated at Old Skatness. And this is a quite specialised building with a massive hearth on the outside, and we've got an oven structure, which is very, very similar to the one that we see here at Swandro. So, we, 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 we're, we're seeing parallels in, in architecture. Um, and this seems quite a specialised um, uh, in terms of processing. We, we had all sorts of interesting things associated with the use of, uh, of uh, this building here at Skatness. So we're just getting a little bit of insight into the archaeology. Uh, but underneath that hearth and that, that flagging, where the sea had taken that away, what we have is a series of archaeological uh, deposits. You can see uh, we've got wall lines coming through here and some depth of stratigraphy. Let's go to the next one. And uh, there, there you can see we've got this wall that again that's been truncated by the sea so we've got a truncation event there. Uh, then we've got this earlier material underneath and we've got a floor surface there. And the pottery that we're getting from these earlier layers is almost identical to the early Iron Age pottery that we see on some of the uh, very early roundhouses in, in Orkney, and in particular, uh, the, the site of Tufts Ness, uh, the, the, a number of parallel uh, sherds to, to this one. They're, they're typically flat rimmed, a lot of, a lot of temper in them, and uh, uh, flat or splayed rims. And uh, also from the, the same deposits, where there's this little uh, uh, silted uh, pendant. Now, if, if, we, if, if, if we look at structure one, uh, which is actually in this area here, uh, this is a later um, shot of it. This is where the oven is. That's that big flag. We're only, at this stage, we've only got part of it. Um, uh, cleared from the beach deposits. So this, this is structure one, and it's associated with a, a, a much larger building, uh, which is this building with all these casement walls. Now, at first we thought that it was a brock, but then we had these series of wall lines uh, uh, with a series of outer faces, which didn't look brock-like. We then thought, well, what sort of monuments have that that structure, and uh, uh, we, we've got a number of chambered cairns. Coiness on sand day is a good example where you have these series of casement walls, um, and uh, we, we toyed with that idea. But with the fuller excavation that we have been able to undertake in 2018, 2019, uh, what we seem to have is a large roundhouse, and that roundhouse is multi-phased, and the earlier part of the roundhouse. Um, if we go to the next slide. This is just showing you some of the, uh, the, the, the case for uh, uh, Next one. And uh, uh, what, what we seem to have is a very complex stratigraphy. This is the outer wall of the roundhouse. And we have this secondary wall here, butting on retaining material uh, 
um, uh, 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 beyond it. And just right underneath, just down here, uh, we've got uh, 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 some midden deposits with, uh, uh, with, with, with bone in. Um, and if, if we look at the radiocarbon dates from the material that's retained by that secondary wall, from the material that comes from under, uh, underneath that secondary wall, and the uh, uh, material that's retained within that, those, uh, between those casement walls. Uh, they all produce really tight early Iron Age dates. Um, it, 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 um, there seems to be a cons consistency in that area of the site, giving us a, a period between 800 and 400 BC. And uh, this is, if we go to the next slide, it, it's quite an, an important period because what we're dealing with is uh, pre brock structures in many ways. Uh, this uh, site here is the, the site at Tosnes on Sunday, and you can see the roundhouse structure with a, an annex there, um, which, which has the same date range. Uh, but what's interesting about Tosnes is this is a very poor site. These are people living on the edge. They're cracking the uh, 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 bones to get the marrow out. That they're taking high risk strategies. We've got really good evidence on, on, on how they're, they're, they're living. And, and, it, and it demonstrates people who are at the lower end of society, very much on the edge. Uh, whereas this is a site of Boo, uh, excavated by John Hedges. And uh, this is a, a much larger roundhouse, same date. But the, at first, the, this site was thought to be uh, uh, an, early, an early Brock form. Uh, but um, uh, it's now been regarded as, as, a, as a large roundhouse. But what I would consider is that is a precursor to the, the Brock form. So what we're seeing between those two sites are poor and elite. And I think from the, the evidence that we're getting from Swandro, we're looking at the elite side of the Iron Age with uh, uh, Swandro. If we go to the next slide. Um, so if, if, if we look in the uh, center of that, that house is multi-phased. So we're, we, we, we've, we, we've, we've got a, a series of truncation events and we're being able to identify some of the floor layers. You can see we've got some good hearth structures there, evidence of paving and so on. Uh, go to the next one, please. And there uh, underneath uh, one of the, the hearths, we've got some earlier elements of the structure, which includes this uh, corbelled uh, feature, which uh, seems we, we at first we thought was a corbelled cell, uh, but uh, it could well be a well. Next, uh, and this is the main entrance way going into the uh, uh, big this big monumental roundhouse, and you can see there are several phases to the entrance. Um, uh, various structural phases. You can see that the, there's differences. These are two really large stones. They're about three meters in length, and these would originally have been upright. So a significant structure, again, suggestive of monumentality. And there's this cell on the outside of the, uh, 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 coming off on, on this side to the uh, uh, outer entrance. Uh, if you go down here, you end up into structure one, uh, and another cell that we haven't quite investigated on, on that side. Go to the next slide. And uh, th this is further up. And here you can see some of the, 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 the collapse, uh, major stonework. Uh, uh, um, and what we seem to have is the collapse of, of corbel roofing material. Next slide. Uh, in antiquity, there's a lot of changes to the building. So this is the, uh, just outside the entrance, this is the uh, uh, wall of the roundhouse and the entrance passage. And what you can see there is uh, the, uh, the cell running off there. But this is the entrance to the cell and you can see it's been blocked off. And we've got a series of blockings uh, within, the, uh, within that roundhouse that survived, indicating that uh, again, this sort of multi-use and, 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 and distinct periods of change, which we're trying to work out. And this, this cell, again, was roofed, and we've got evidence of some of the stone lintels that, that uh, 
as uh, went across the, the, the cell. And this is Jackie McKinley, who takes her holidays from, uh, she's an osteoarchaeologist for, for Wessex. You may have seen her on Time Team and meet the ancestors uh, for every year. She, she takes her holidays to come and, uh, and, and uh, excavate with us and, uh, and, to, and to train our students. And uh, 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 this, this is the uh, uh, passageway under excavation. Uh, and uh, you, you can see you can see the uh, uh, the excavated passage. But what's sort of interest is we've got two two cupboard uh, uh, recesses, ombres or cupboards. And this is a, a three dimensional model that's been uh, made from uh, a, a photo mosaic of images uh, taken by uh, out from the air by a drone. Uh, which, which shows Sandro behind uh, the that passageway is there. This is the entrance there. These are the two big stones, and you can see how the sea is taken away. Uh, the, the everything on this side it, it sort of steps up into the centre of the building, and here we've got structure one and those earlier deposits, which. Uh, butt up against the outer wall of the roundhouse at that stage. I'm going to pass over now to Julie. He's going to talk a little bit about one of the buildings or, or, or the, one of the structures within that roundhouse, which is of great interest, Structure 5. Okay, so as you come in, you can see those big stones that have collapsed in the, in, in the entranceway there. And there was this strange, you'd expect to see a, a petitioned you know, in a roundhouse or a brock, a kind of petitioned interior, but instead of which there's a quite a substantial wall that comes along here, a doorway through here into this really odd shaped building or, or, or room just here. And that's what we were working on uh, in 2019, mostly just before um, everything struck, shut down, as you know. And because we're a bit further away from the sea, the deposits are quite deep here. You can see these enormous great orthostats forming uh, little cells and parts of the wall and so on. And these very deep uh, middens. And those middens are really quite interesting because they gave us some of the best environmental evidence we've got from, from this site. Uh, it included, but it's very strange. There are lots of animal bones in there, the kinds of things you might expect, the, the domestic animals and so on. But there are also quite a lot of birds. Um, this here is um, a white-tailed sea eagle skull. And then um, this here and this here are the upper and lower jaws of a great orc. And there are other birds. You can see here there's one that is pretty much articulated. In other words, it, all the bones are where they should be. You can see the two wings there. And I, I meant to look up what this was. I think it was a small, um, a small bird of prey of some kind, but I can't remember exactly what now. Um, and also within that, don't ever let anyone tell you they didn't fish in the Iron Age because they certainly did um, around these kind of coasts. These are all, you can see the scale here in centimeters and these are all fish bones. These are fish vertebrae uh, from one and two year old um, saith probably. Um, so we're looking basically at what, what um, you know, in the 19th century they'd have called silics and pultex the, first and second year old say that you get around the coastline. But there are huge, huge numbers of them um, within those deposits. And we're still trying to work out why, um, because obviously they haven't been eaten whole. If they had been, we wouldn't have the bones, certainly not in the middle of the roundhouse. Um, there are also things like this. Um, you can probably just see that the, the teeth are missing from this, but this is a, um, a beautiful um, antler weaving comb actually again from inside that building. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, we had just got down to the floor surface at the end of the 2019 season. And again, this is a slightly strange building in that it has about three um, halves in there. The, the main one is here, these big set of slabs here, but there are two smaller kind of specialist function halves, one over here and one over here. The really strange thing about this one was that there's a, there was a big standing stone behind it and that standing stone and this part of the wall were entirely covered in a, a, a bright yellow clay. 
obviously there are only parts of it left for us to see, but you could see that clay had been used. And again, that's something we saw at Skatnes was the use of white and yellow clays. So again, these houses would not have been as dark as maybe you might have expected. And I'm gonna hand back to Steve because this is one of his favorite buildings or the next two are. Yeah. Um, so a lot of our work has been concentrated on, on structure one and, uh, and the, the roundhouse because you can clearly see that they're associated. But we've also uh, uh, looked along the coastline uh, uh, at, at other associated structures that, that were surviving underneath the Boulder Beach. Um, th this is a good example of, of one of them. Uh, this is structure two. And there you can see the proximity to, to the sea and the, 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 the flagging here. Um, you, you, you can see we've lost the, the, the walls on that side. The sea's taken all that material away. Um, this is a, a shot from the air of, of that same uh, section at, uh, the year before, actually. Um, uh, uh, and you can see the flags the, uh, forming the, uh, uh, the floor of the building. Uh, now this building again is multi-phased. Uh, the stage that we're looking at here belongs to the late Iron Age or the Pictish period, where and as we were able to excavate uh, down, we were getting earlier features within that building. Uh, so uh, here, for example, we've got a stone lined tank, and uh, again um, hearths. There's a hearth here and the suggestion um, of some metalwork in debris as well uh, that, that we've, we had associated with that building. Um, what's interesting is the dates that are coming from that stage of the building. This is the, the same building looking from the sea landward and you can see how the archaeology has been taken away by the, the sea and how it survives far better as you're going in, inland. So this this is this uh, truncation that we're seeing. Uh, but the uh, radio carbon dates from this level uh, suggest a, a fourth century day. And we also have a, a coin that again is fourth century. It's, uh, uh, it's a coin of Con Constance uh, who reigned uh, 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 348 to 350. And those coins were in circulation for quite a short period. If we go to the next slide. Uh, this is structure three which is just a little bit further along. Uh, it almost conjoins structure two. Uh, it, it's the next structure along uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the beach. So the, going away from the, the, the roundhouse towards uh, uh, the, the barrels of West Ness. Um, this is the building that had one of those Norse longhouse walls going over it. And uh, what we have here is uh, a, a structure um, with an entranceway here coming in. You can see there's an ombre or cut cupboard here. And uh, 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 this is the back slab for uh, the, the hearth. And here you can see a hearth stone coming through here. But the thing to note is how black all these deposits are. And they're, they're, they're really interesting. We'll come on to talk about those in, in a minute. Uh, to get into the building, you actually have to come down a flight of steps. So you're going down into the building, into a passageway, which we have here. So the steps are up here, come down the steps, into the passageway, through into the building. Next slide. Uh, within that building, and associated with those black layers, we found three anvils. Here are two of them. Uh, uh, this one... <laughs> Uh, was set upright and you, there's, there's pecking uh, on, on the top where, where that had been used as an anvil. This one was on, on its side and there's a smaller square anvil uh, next to that. Uh, this hit the press quite a, uh, a, a, few, a couple of years ago in a big way. It, it, it was reported throughout Britain and also in the, in the States because of these carbonized traces of fingerprints. Uh, 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 of fingers and what appear to be um, uh, uh, areas of sooty that, that had gone into the stone uh, from the uh, uh, from somebody kneeling uh, against it. So um, we, we've, we've got signs of metalwork 
with these anvils, but we also got that human interaction uh, that, that we see with those, uh, those imprints. Next one. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Jerry McDonald, who's looking at uh, the archaeometallurgy of the, the site. He's one of the uh, leading archaeometallurgists uh, who's worked on Scottish sites. Um, and uh, he, he, he was really interested in, in what we're being able to uh, 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 see here and sampled it uh, uh, throughout. You can see some of the sample bags. What he has in his hand here is actually a portable XRF uh, uh, machine. So what he's doing is using X-ray fluorescence and being able to analyze the soil in situ and to be able to work out chemical composition changes across that floor surface. And what he was able to determine was that there was a huge amount of uh, copper uh, uh, be, uh, that was found in this area here, um, which it's quite interesting because we've got this ombre here, uh, we've got the hearth which is on here, but this is where we've got two of those anvils is in situ. The next. Uh, in terms of dating, uh, what we've got is a huge amount of um, evidence for archaeometallurgy, uh, strongly suggesting we've got a smithy, we've got evidence of bellows being used because we've got the twirls from the bellows, uh, we, we've got uh, a, a lot of slag, uh, we, we've got crucible fragments, we've got mold fragments, so we know they're, they're with the, the evidence of the copper, that there's copper alloy casting, we've also got evidence of iron smithing as well, uh, and uh, this black layer is, is just full of this material from the smithing, and the dates that we've got for that indicate that we, we've got usage in the first century AD. Next slide. And I think one of the interesting things about this building is with the evidence Jerry's been able to gather, we've got a very good idea about the use of space. I mentioned the, um, this is a, one of the 3D models um, uh, derived from some of the laser scan data. So here are the steps going in, one goes into the building. Now, this is the, the, the doorway. We, we know which way the door opened uh, because we've got the pivot uh, stone for the door in situ. And what's really interesting, it can be locked from the outside, but it could also be locked from the inside. And here's the two anvils. This is the hearth. Uh, uh, this is the area where we've got all the copper uh, and the majority of the, the smithing evidence from. But over here, we've got evidence for the queers. So we can imagine somebody at, on this position here, this side of the pumping away into the hearth to get the hearth up to temperature and uh, the, the concept of this being going down into the building being able to lock the door doors is because light is really incredible important because it is your temperature gauge so uh, by able to see what color the, the the metal that you're working or you're casting is so important in being able to allow you to um, determine uh, the the, the the right time to do certain processes uh, within the uh, casting or the uh, smithing process. Next. Underneath that building, what, uh, one of the things that uh, surprised us was that we had evidence, what we think is a, is a ditch. Uh, we found it on the, on the seaward side, but it, it had been badly destroyed, taken away by the sea. But you can see we've got this face wall uh, and there's an opposing wall uh, the other side. And if we to go along the coastline, about um, uh, three, uh, three quarters of uh, a kilometre uh, going, going westward, you come across the uh, brock site at uh, Midhow. And this is the Midhow brock. And I'll show you a picture of that later. But here, what we have is, the, is one of the ditches from Midhow. And you can see how very similar that is. So that suggests that we're dealing with a defended element of the site uh, that, that probably is of the same period to the construction of that roundhouse. And then we have a, a, an expansion of the settlement in the first century BC, first century AD, which, which sees the infilling of the ditch and reconfiguration of, 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 uh, of the structures and probably goes hand in hand 
with those changes that we're beginning to see in the roundhouse itself. Uh, structure four is a late structure. This, this is uh, um, uh, again higher up and this building dates to the pictures period. Um, and what's interesting about that is the, the, the flagging, but we also have a, a wall hearth in here. And what, what we think seem to have is a, a building uh, that's partly used, we think, uh, as, a, as a processing structure for, for grain, because what we think we have is a, a, is a threshing floor and a corn dryer built into the wall. And uh, this is the, the flooring that we think is a threshing structure. This is the, the, the wall hearth that we have here. And again, at Scatness, we've got a building uh, that survives a much better state of affairs. Affair, but again, here you can see the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dry, drying kiln and uh, you see the ash here. And this is absolutely full of carbonized barley. And we're getting the same thing in these deposits here. So I'm going to hand back over to Julie, who's going to talk about the Viking evidence that we got on the site. Yes, so just very quickly, if we, if you remember right at the beginning, I said one of the things we were really interested in was the idea that these really rich, long lived sites in the Northern Isles were the ones that were targeted by the Vikings for first settlement. And although we had those burials nearby, which were definitely first settlers, they weren't. Some of those Vikings were not coming from Orkney, they were coming from uh, way north of the Arctic Circle and Scandinavia. One of the women was certainly from Ireland or from the Western Isles. Um, so although we had those houses, those late North houses, next to the Nauswandro, we didn't have evidence for these very first settlers until um, we started excavating that entrance passage into the roundhouse. And uh, there were some very strange deposits within that, including, uh, you can see a, a collection of bones here, which include a couple of sheep that appear to have been butchered, but also a cat, um, which had also been killed and skinned that was lying on top of the sheep. Um, and quite handily, a coin. And this coin is about the size of my, um, well, it's probably about a centimeter across. It's not a very inspiring coin to look at, it's copper alloy. What's really interesting though is the inscription on it because this is a, a coin um, from Northumbria. This is a coin of a king called Enred, um, who is a pretty obscure Northumbrian king, but basically was around at the end of the um, oh, it was ten, early 10th century, I think, isn't it? Um, he's very short lived, which is um, handy for us because it gives us quite a good date. And talking to Gavin uh, Williamson, who's the uh, Gareth Williamson, who's the coin expert at the British Museum, he said the only reason he could think that a coin of Northumbria would be in Orkney at that time is if a Viking had brought it. So we started to get a few tantalizing hints that we really did somewhere under there. We do have um, the Viking settlement, the first Viking settlement, those people who were buried at Westness. And uh, right in the top of a, a roundhouse, another roundhouse next to the big one on the shore um, is a very different kind of mitten, not like the stuff that we're getting from the Iron Age at all. And within that, and next to that Pictish building that Steve's just shown you, um, we got this, this which is a, um, a spindle wool made of a, a cattle, uh, the femoral head from a, from a cow that's been sawn off. And these are quite common in the Viking period. And a rather nice little um, 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 needle case with decoration on it in bone, which again is also quite a typical Viking piece really. So really we think that um, some of this material we're seeing in the Iron Age is, is gives us an indication of something which is a really long-lived um, farming estate if you like. I mean they've got metal working. This is one of those tuyères that Steve was talking about or a fragment of it. This is where the bellows would have gone. These are um, these this particular ones made of clay and it would have um, basically prevented the bellows from burning, but you can see the clay is completely vitrified from the heat um, of, the, of, the, of the fire of the furnace. And this is a, um, a, a cheek piece from a um, horse harness made out of antler. And uh, you see these, well, you see these actually all over Europe in the Bronze Age and onwards. Um, but again, the idea that you've got people who are riding horses at Swandro on that tiny island in the Iron Age suggests that we're looking at 
um, a higher status site. And as we were thinking all along that this, these are the sites the Vikings choose, not least because these are the good farming estates and they have these rich resources behind them. Steve, do you want to yeah. talk about? Yeah, and very quickly, just to finish off, um, so we, we have this exposure of archaeology under the Boulder Beach. We, we have the archaeology that we've investigated with the, the, the Roundhouse. Um, in 2019, uh, our last excavation season uh, before COVID, one of the things we wanted to do was to see, well, what does that settlement along the beach there mean? How does that fit in with the, the Roundhouse? So. Um, I managed to persuade one of my colleagues, Professor Chris Gaffney, who you may have seen on some of the early time team programmes. Um, he, uh, he, he um, came up with uh, a number of different techniques trying to help us identify what, what was going on. Uh, this is resistivity surveying, but resistivity surveying with a difference because what he's doing is doing a series of surveys at one go. Uh, because you can see that there are multiple probes going through there. So what he's doing is doing different probe uh, combinations to actually begin to see uh, different depths. So each one of these is a slightly different depth, a slightly different resolution. So what we're seeing in effect is depth slices going through. Um, what, uh, so it gives us some indication of what's there. When we paste the, that information onto the site, What's really intriguing, because this is the, the, the center of the excavation where the roundhouse is, uh, and this is where we've got that exposure coming through. These are the Norse buildings coming through there. What we, what we have is a series of buildings that arc around surrounding that uh, central roundhouse. So we've got a whole series of buildings going around the, 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 uh, uh, the outside. So the, the roundhouse seems to be the central form now, this building goes through into the Brock period, but what we would argue is that it's got a, 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 a what's interesting is that it has this pre, this pre Brock origin and, and, and this continuity going through. It's very similar in many ways to the Brock of Midhow, where you've got the, this is the one just along the coastline, uh, where, you, where I showed you the picture of the ditch. Here we've got the Brock. And around the outside, we've got this extramural settlement around the, the Brock. Uh, Skatness in Shetland, where we excavated for 12 years. Here, we've got the Brock. Now, what's interesting about this Brock is that it's been modified, reused. Um, so the original Brock is quite early. Then we, we, we've got modifications in the first, second century. And then we've got a Pictish building constructed in the middle. The Brock itself is not lowered to that height that you see there. Um, until the Viking period, so it's still, but you can see around it, we've got this settlement. So this is a nucleated village uh, centered on the monumental roundhouse or Brock. At the, uh, and uh, we, again, we've got the ditches going around. This is part of the ditch there, which was in field. So we're beginning to see a pattern emerging. And the other thing that we've tried to do is using GPR and uh, that this is an, and the other techniques in terms of looking at depth. So just trying to get time slices. Again, giving us an indication of where the maximal archaeology is and how it falls off. Um, I won't go into too much detail because I know time is pressing. But also, it, how does this fit into the landscape? Well, this is the whole of that, uh, that coastline that was uh, surveyed magnetically by a German team a couple of years ago. Um, so this is a, a, a swan drum. Again, the evidence suggests quite strongly that we've got this nucleated settlement and beyond it, there, there isn't very much. Um, but there, there is some interesting things happening out, uh, outside it, just subtle changes compared to the intensity of magnetic disruption that we've got with all that mid material and building material. And one of the things that we did in a moment of madness uh, was to put a, a series of trenches across the landscape that you can see there. And what we were able to identify was the, the uh, this is the, this is the, um, uh, on, on one edge. Uh, and you can see this is the plow, Monday plow soil going down to bedrock. Uh, this is further in as you're going into uh, um, beyond. And uh, what we've got is uh, that same plough saw. 
And then we've got this really dark soil um, underneath with lots of carbon flecking. And this is an anthropogenic soil. We, we've seen this time and time again. We've seen it at Tufts Nest, we've seen it at Scat Nest, uh, we, we see it at Yarso, where, where there's huge investment in terms of manure and, uh, and land management in the Iron Age that creates these, the, the, these soils. Um, so we're beginning to get a, an understanding of the archaeology. So what we're seeing is, is a village that is created around a large roundhouse. Um, uh, it's not technically a brock. Uh, it's, it, the origins of that house seems to go much earlier than, than the brock, but it has continuity through the brock period and beyond. Um, uh, we're looking at, in terms of the chronology, uh, this sort of transition between late Bronze Age, early Iron Age uh, uh, buildings. We're seeing these sites being sites of longevity. Uh, they, they have a resilience to them. They, they keep their status uh, 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 all the way through. And we think that they're prime sites for the picking, as it were, uh, when the Norse arrived. So, so uh, 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 that, that they're actually taking existing rich agricultural estates. And the other thing in terms of coastal and, uh, erosion is that these are a finite resource because you don't find sites behind them. They're in their location because they were in their optimum location in the past. And unless we save this archaeology from the sea, it's going to be gone forever. Uh, so and in the end, just to say that really what we're dealing with is a high status complex that has this longevity through time. And that's us done. <laughs>